Could we aim asteroid YR4 at the moon on purpose? What would happen to babies born and raised on Mars? Should we use water as an insulation layer for our spacecraft? And in Q&A Plus, could we mine an asteroid that's stuck in a Lagrange point? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are, across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get to the questions. Coat Lord, could we use a dart like impactor to redirect 2024 wire 4 to hit the moon? Seems like a good opportunity to learn a lot about asteroids and lunar impacts. Yes, we probably could try to aim it more towards the moon, but it's, you know, it's pretty hard to predict exactly to make it. You probably hit it a couple of times to keep fine tuning its trajectory and you have to get it right. But if you make a mistake, do you make it hit the earth? So you got to be really careful. But yeah, it would be great. But, you know, objects that size do hit the moon on a regular basis. You know, a 40 meter asteroid is not that big. Mad Monkey Oz. Data from China's Zhurong rover strengthens the case for an ocean with a huge coastline on Mars. What do you think of the hypothesis? I'm just a journalist, so I have no opinion about the hypothesis. However, what scientists are reporting is that there is evidence of the shoreline on Mars. And, you know, we know that there is water on Mars. You look at the polar ice caps, there is water ice still at the surface of Mars. You can imagine a time when there was water at farther latitudes, maybe covered by ice. You have like a, a thick sheet of ice, and then you get this layer of water down at the bottom. That could be easily explained, even under conditions right now. Like there could be water under the ice caps on Mars. You got all this pressure that's pushing down. You got the internal heat coming from Mars that could create this layer of water. And there could be life in there, which would be really interesting. But the Chinese detected the presence of a shoreline. And the way they did that was, you know, this was part of the plan. When they chose the location, the landing location for the Jurong rover, they knew that they were going to be at this place that was thought to be the boundary between what was once an ancient ocean and then the shoreline of that place. And then they had the rover roll around in that area and use its ground penetrating radar system. And they tested this out on some of the lunar spacecraft that they've sent, they're able to peer down through the regolith about 100 meters, and and could see the size of the regolith get bigger and bigger and bigger on the moon, you know, see at the very surface, it's powder, and then below that it's kind of pebbles, and then it's larger rocks, and eventually it's boulders, all the way down 100 meters as far as the as the radar could go. And so they did the same thing with the uh, with the mission to Mars, Jurong had a ground penetrating radar system that allowed them to look down under the surface. And so Mars today is covered by sand dunes and drifts and all of that material. But Jurong went and just went back and forth over the area where they thought the shoreline was going to be, and then measured the depth of what was underneath it. And they found this spot, this this shoreline, where the angle of of hardened rock covered by sand was the angle that you get when you're at the side of an ocean, and that they were able to then confirm they were able to follow along where this shoreline is and confirm that yeah, that that's that perfectly matches that you had a liquid ocean waves lapping against a shore that were then creating this shoreline. And to have evidence that you know, there's there's some other evidence as well that was found. So people found um, ripples in sand that the kinds of things if you go to a beach and you you know, when the tide goes out, but the waves have been have been going up and down, you get these ripples in the sand and they found some places where you had rippled rock that matched that. But you can kind of get that with wind. So this was like a really firm evidence that Mars once had a liquid ocean a fairly large liquid ocean and had waves and was crashing against the shoreline. It's a pretty amazing, you know, I think it's probably the greatest discovery made by the Jurong rover, and just shows the benefit of sending a ground penetrating radar to worlds like this. When you think about the upcoming Europa Clipper mission, the thing that I'm most excited about that is that they're going to have this a similar system, they're going to be able to penetrate the ice and map out where are reservoirs of water, are there cracks and stuff under the surface of the ice, how deep does the ice go before you hit the, the ocean underneath? 
Christian Desalier, why does the Fermi paradox assume advanced civilizations would expand at 10% the speed of light? Is this realistic given the immense challenge of establishing societies on distant alien worlds? So the expectation is not that alien civilizations would expand at 10% the speed of light. The expectation is that they would expand at 99.99% the speed of light, that they would attempt to gather as much territory as possible within the laws of physics. And so if you set out today at just shy of the speed of light, you could create a volume of empire with a radius of 16 and a half billion light years. If you leave today, so you got to hurry. Um, that's pretty big. Now, of course, that is just going to be a tiny drop in the bucket of the much larger universe that is outside of your smaller little part. Um, but that's if you leave today and you go at 99% the speed of light, if you go slower than that, then you're not going to be able to to reach that much of the universe. 94% of the universe has fallen over the cosmic horizon. So 6% 6 of the universe is reachable if you set off at the speed of light. And so that is going to be the limit that these advanced civilizations are going to be driving for is to get to this maximum rate. And so when we look out into the universe, the expectation is that we should see these civilizations growing at the speed of light. But the thing is, is that if you can see, or I guess you can't see the civilization growing at the speed of light, because when you first notice the civilization, that wave front of expansion is passing you by and you sudden, you know, it's like you learn the Borg are out there and now you're part of the Borg. So, um, Obviously, if if there is some, but and so there's no physical limit that says you can't go 99.999% the speed of light. It's within the laws of physics, and so that is probably going to be the limit. Now, what do they do? I mean, they're going to send self-replicating robot probes. You just need to send one. It makes its way to a star system. It settles down in the galaxy, finds an asteroid belt, starts producing more copies of itself. Those send themselves off to other galaxies within the reachable distance, and then the others start filling in the missing pieces where they go from star to star, gobbling up resources, creating more probes, going to more star systems, building more probes, setting up their Dyson spheres, surrounding each of the stars in the Dyson spheres, setting up stellar engines that move the stars around into a more attractive configuration. That's the kinds of things that a civilization without limits would attempt. It's time to shout out all the $5 patrons and above. Paul Rodman, TH Barker, David, Alex I, Conrad Cumley, Robert Thomas, Tony Baez, Robert, Tyler Dennis, and Roger Booth. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Web Fiji, is there anything such as absolute stillness in the universe, like staying in one place and watching planet stars and entire galaxies zip past? Well, you could just do that. Um, you know, you could go wherever you want and move at whatever velocity you want, and then you watch things go past you at the velocity that you want. Um, there is no single place that is not moving in the universe that, that that doesn't exist. It's not a like everything is moving relative to other things. You know, you are moving at 1600 kilometers per hour if you're sitting at the equator um, relative to the outside of the earth because the earth is turning and you are moving, you know, 1000 miles an hour in a circle. Congratulations. You know, you're the fastest human on earth. But that's because relative to the surface of the Earth, you're not moving. So really, you always have to just say compared to what? Telecomic. Do you think human gestation and fetus development will be negatively affected by the low gravity of Mars? We just have no idea. Nobody knows. Nobody has done the experiment. Nobody has put a mammal into one third Earth gravity, and then gestated it to completion and then had the animal give birth, and then saw if there were any development issues with the animal. And that that experiment seems important if people are planning to go to Mars and live and raise their families there. Every person who was born on Mars could be not viable. That could that's a possibility. We don't know the answer to this question. And so uh, the only way to answer that question is to is to have experiments that you start with some kind of rotating space station that has artificial gravity, and you can dial that gravity down to different levels. And then you have various animals that you have them procreate gestate. Uh, and then you see if there's any issues and you probably want to go multiple generations. And so if you, you know, if they, if you have mice and the mice give 
birth to babies and then the babies, you bring them back down to earth and then you see if there's any issues generations down the road and then you scale up to monkeys and then eventually you feel like you've done enough experiments that you think you're ready to try this with human beings or to let human beings take this risk knowing the con the possible consequences but also knowing that the monkeys turned out okay and we don't know any of this we just don't know it and so anyone who tells you that they would like to build a city on Mars and that send humans there permanently to begin this great civilization um, without sterilizing them all is is asking you to take a total risk. You know, like how many um, babies with birth defects are you willing to have? All of them? So, uh, you know, whenever you consider these plans, you, there are all these basics that need to be worked out and they haven't been worked out yet. Len Kelter, if we ever start exploring interstellar distances with very long duration missions, is there a solution to the dilemma that future technology would inevitably leapfrog the first mission? Uh, that's called the weight calculation. And the answer is no, you wait, you wait until your technology won't leapfrog the, miss the mission that you would already send. Once you know how fast your civilization is advancing, you know how much energy you're producing, how much energy it takes to go to another solar system, you can calculate the day when you don't need to wait anymore and you can just send the spacecraft that will not be overtaken. Casey Reem, would it be possible to have an X-ray or gamma ray interferometer or could we not align to that level? Probably not. You know, and also like X-rays and gamma rays, you don't focus them in the same way that you do with a with like an infrared telescope or a radio telescope or even a visible telescope that they require. Um, it's called like incidence. So essentially, you've got this this cone, and the X-rays are coming down the cone, and you can't you can't focus them. You can just nudge them so that they're more likely to fall on your detector. So. Um, no, it, it feels like it would be practically impossible, but theoretically possible. Jewel Car Serum, how do you feel about using liquid water insulation for the inside of a spacecraft? Imagine an exterior hull layer of water, internal centrifuge. Yeah, liquid water or ice water, frozen water is a great insulator against space radiation. You just need one meter. If you have one meter of water, then you are protected from space radiation. Cosmic rays, radiation coming from the sun, you're set. And it doesn't have to be water, it can be regolith, it can be whatever, you just need protons in between you and space. And the advantage of having water is you can also drink it. And you can use it for fuel if you need to. So so water would be great. You can imagine some future spacecraft that is surrounded, you know, a sphere of water. Wouldn't it be a very weird spacecraft? And then it, there's a habitat inside. Did you know that you can watch the same video, but with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call that Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, could we mine asteroids stuck in a Lagrange point? I'll put a link in the show notes. You can just go watch that version. All right, those are all the questions that we had this episode. Thank you, everybody who asked your questions in the YouTube comments, everybody who joined us for the live show. We're still on our live stream hiatus back in three weeks, but uh, I'm going to talk about the media that I am consuming during this summer break. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Barry Lake Roofing, Brian Bode, Caradron, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, and David Matz, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Moore, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Smith, Michael Brousseau, Modso, Nick Borquez, Nick Solari, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Robeck, Shun Sargent, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Chiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So just an update of all of the media that I have been consuming this summer. Uh, so first, video games. Uh, I had picked up Mechabellum uh, a couple of months back and played it a little bit and thought it was interesting. And then I've been watching a couple of live streams. Uh, Crip was playing uh, Mechabellum and I thought, oh, okay, all right, I'll give it another shot. And I've been really into it. It's a great game. It's sort of an auto battler where you play against an opponent and every round you get more points and you send these mechs and tanks and aircraft against each other. And there's a lot of fine tuned, you know, which units counter which units and you can upgrade things in different ways. And so you can sort of respond to the battlefield as it changes round after round, but things are kind of locked in place. And so you're, you're, 
it's kind of like a tower defense game against another opponent where you're sort of tower defensing each other. Anyway, it's it's a really fun game and I can see that it's going to take, it's one of those easy to start lifetime to master kind of games. The other game I've been playing a lot of is Darkest Dungeon 2. Now, I really like Darkest Dungeon. I finished the game. Um, Darkest Dungeon 2 is different and kind of confusing to me. I'm still within the first, say, 20 hours of playing the game, but I'm starting to get the gist of it. And the battles are very much the same way as they were in Darkest Dungeon 1, where you sort of have this town and you are attempting to defeat some great evil with these adventurers, but the adventurers get go crazy and uh, they get all kinds of, of illnesses that you have to sort of manage and take care of. And it's sort of the same thing. What makes Darkest, the whole Darkest Dungeon series is great is the just the ambiance, the mood where you've got this this incredible narrator uh, and just the quality of the of the art all fits together and it's just it's a wonderful experience to play those games. So if you've ever played Darkest Dungeon One, definitely give it a try. And if you you know you cross that hump into Darkest Dungeon Two, uh, let me know because I'm still kind of struggling with it. Um, on the book front, I'm now finishing up the sixth book in the Dungeon Crawler Carl series, uh, and it's good. I think I think it's my favorite so far. They do keep getting better and better as less of the time is spent considering the dungeon and more of the time is spent considering the universe that this is playing in. And I think that was the right decision to take, which is it's not about it being this repetitive dungeon. It's about this larger universe that is deeply flawed and messed up. And Carl and the rest of the dungeon crawlers are trying to affect outside of their situation. On the TV front... I'm watching Foundation, which is is good. Uh, it's again, it's, it has nothing to do with the books, apart from a couple of names being the same. And so you have to sort of take it on its own. And a lot of ideas are terrific, like the idea of the of the Cleons, this empire where they just keep releasing clones of themselves so they can maintain power forever. Uh, but other ideas, I think, are are a little bit diminished. So, but I think it's its own thing, and it's sci-fi, and you know, watch it. We also just finished watching the second season of The Sandman, which kind of wraps up the what was in the graphic novels. And I think that's the end of the show. And I think that's perfectly fine, especially considering sort of the controversy with uh, with Neil Gaiman. And so, yeah, like just it's done. Let it go. And then the last show that I'm watching, which we've only seen a couple of episodes, is Chief of War. And uh, this is based on sort of fighting between the various islands of Hawaii and has you know Jason Momoa is the is the lead in this and the part that was surprising to me was they stuck to everybody is speaking Hawaiian for the entire show for two episodes everybody speaking Hawaiian and I was sure there was going to be this moment where they were going to switch over and go no, no no now you know just to show you they're actually speaking Hawaiian but now everyone's going to speak English nope it's been Hawaiian the entire time and it's great to see uh, you know, it's just something you never see. And so I'm really looking forward to it. So far, I've, been, I've really enjoyed it. And I think it's a it's a really good show. So Sandman's on Netflix. Foundation is on Apple TV. And Chief of War is on Apple TV. I gotta say, Apple TV is becoming a thing that is worth paying for month after month after month. They we keep going, oh, there's one more show and then we're gonna get rid of it. And nope, we just keep watching. All right, we'll see you next time.